Yep. Yay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Claude Department of Higher Education. Um, happy Open Education Week. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we will be recording this session. Uh, and I think just can you all give me a thumbs up if you can hear us? And maybe you can hear us better from this side of the microphone. Do we need Logna to come over here and reshare? Essentially, we're going to record this meeting just so everyone knows. And we'll be getting started here in just a moment. Yeah, and I will just kick it off to Emily and Steve, okay. and y'all could do introductions mm -hmm. and start us off whenever you're ready. Okay, well, Thanks, thank you, Lobna. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Emily Reagan, and I'm here with my colleague, Steve Crisman, and we're going to be sharing some of our adventures in OER and open pedagogy. So we're coming to you from Metropolitan State University of Denver. We share um, a campus with two other institutions, CCD at uh, Community College of Denver and CU Denver. We have a shared library. We have librarian Ellen Metter here in the room with us today. And MSU Denver is an open access um, university that educates about 20,000 students here in the heart of Denver. We have 46% of our students are students of color, 56% of our students are first generation students, and we have a large number of Pell eligible students. Um, over 40% of our students are Pell Grant eligible. We recently received a federal Hispanic serving institution status, and here we teach typically four, four loads. We're a primarily undergraduate institution and faculty here have a focus on teaching, and we're all here because teaching is the first priority, and we may also have some research uh, in the service of our students, but this is an institution where teaching really comes first. And um, our president, Dr. Janine Davidson, recently gave a TED Talk last September, and she really understands the affordability crisis in higher education, and she really laid out very clearly how um, on a state level we've oh, okay. funded higher education, and this is creating challenges for students, and this is something that those of us who are involved in open educational resources are very aware of. This that, I would do the same if I had a married I also had the like that. Look at this. Talk last September. Yeah. And I talked about my journey as a learner and an educator and how really I think uh, learning uh, works best when we focus on recall and reflection, but also how an educational. No, don't apologize. I, I, yes, yeah. I'm, I'd be happy when we're done with so it. This <laughs> idea of recall and reflection <laughs> comes from the learning literature I, I, and I, really the content that we use interfaces oh, with our ability. Yeah. Oh, I just thought I would join this. So if you could just mute OER yourself real fast on your audio. Yeah, that'll make OER. it easier for us all to hear. We appreciate it. But I think I will. I will be at my key one once Make sure we out. don't have any cross contamination of sound here. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate you all. Um, and so thinking about how our content helps support student student learning is really where I'm coming at open educational resources and open pedagogy. Um, we have been lucky here at MSU Denver to have received over the, over the last year and then coming into this year about $130,000 in grants from the state to support open educational resources initi initiatives. And this money is going to supporting faculty in review workshops. We have OER adoption grants available for faculty, and we're supporting faculty and attending faculty learning communities around open educational resources and open pedagogy. And that is where this talk is coming out of. So Steve um, is a participant in the spring uh, 2020 OER FLC, and I'm facilitating it along with Ellen Metter. And this is a presentation we were going to do anyway for this particular session. And since it fell on Open Education Week, we decided that we would share it with a larger audience. So our first adventure, we're going to hear about Steve's experience using uh, OER in his classroom. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And it's, uh, it's always it's great to have Emily uh, here at the university. She's taught me everything I know about, about this stuff. Um, what I wanted to, to start out by saying is that um, I'm even with the gray hair, I'm still a young professor. Uh, I've only been doing this for about four years now. And so um, I've learned, uh, I've had a, a learning curve as I've, as I've come here to the university uh, and uh, 
pretty much inherited a public relations program that already had textbooks, that already had a curriculum. Um, but I felt that as someone who was coming into this job from the industry, uh, my, my past has been in public relations and in journalism, um, that the, the, everything needed freshened up. And you know, the, the intro class, the fundamentals class was fine. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the textbook for that was very good. It was fundamental and, you could, and it worked just fine. But once you get into the upper division classes where you're trying to go down deeper into things like media relations or crisis communications, um, uh, the, the textbooks that were available were just way too general for that. And not only that, they were pretty much out of date. Uh, in the media industry is changing so dramatically that um, you, you know, every day or every year uh, there's something new in, in social media or the way that we reach out to uh, traditional media. So nothing was really fitting as I was, as I was working um, to update these, these upper division classes. And so uh, what I wanted to share with you is, is ultimately what happened was is I, I wound up doing open uh, educational resources three different ways. Uh, and the first way was uh, to augment the textbook. So I was able to find a textbook that worked, but it still uh, needed something online or something that was more fresh uh, to, to augment it. So I did that for one course. Uh, in, in the next course, I, I actually uh, replaced, I didn't even use a textbook. I just went out and by that point, I had got some training from Emily and uh, was, was aware of where to find the materials. So I was able to piece together something that um, would stand in place of a textbook. And now I'm working on a class this fall that um, actually is another brand new class. And um, I found the perfect textbook online in, in the Open Educational Resources um, database. Uh, but it still could use a little bit of improvement. So I'm gonna customize it for that class. So I'm gonna walk you through um, those three things, like I could say it was a pretty intense learning curve for me, and hopefully that by sharing you know, what I did, I might be able to help you cut some, some corners. So um, the first class, let's see here, can we advance it? Okay, um, the first class uh, was the, the situation where I augmented a textbook, and I was creating a new, a new class called Media and Influencer Relations, and this was a course that went down deep into how do we get stories told by traditional media, whether it's newspapers or TV or, or radio, but also by bloggers and by YouTubers and other people who are uh, online and, and influencing people's behaviors and opinions. Uh, and it's, it's an area that is definitely changing constantly. And uh, I knew from, uh, again, from my industry experience that uh, the author of that first book, The New Rules of Marketing and PR, is a recognized expert in the industry on this topic. Um, and so I knew I was gonna use his book uh, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, he continually updates this book online with a, on his website. So uh, I knew this, this book um, would be the, the latest. And then I found another book that um, I hadn't seen before, but it was, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a rather entertaining read. The author drops a few F-bombs, so I knew my students would love it. Uh, and I also knew my students would love it because one was $18 and one was $17. And, um, but the problem with using um, business books like this, I found, is that they're really heavy on the how-tos and the practical aspects of things and not really good at the underpinnings and the philosophies and the principles. Uh, and so um, to, to augment that, I went online. And at this point, I still hadn't taken a, a lesson with, with Emily. So I was kind of just casting about on my own. And I, I admit I found probably materials that maybe you know, like from Harvard Business Review that you know, maybe wasn't the best um, source uh, in terms of uh, copyright protections and that sort of thing. Um, and then I also would find industry blogs that were, you know, opinion pieces. And uh, I, I admit, I, I did a lot of, of um, uh, academic articles, but uh, I didn't really make my students read the academic articles because I knew they wouldn't read them. <laughs> so I kind of uh, used them as, you know, you know for, for my own purposes to augment my, my lectures. But I pieced this all together and, and I felt like it was, um, it was a it was a good way to get a start in um, in 
in doing uh, uh, open educational uh, resources. By the next class, this one was the PR planning research and measurement, which is yet another new class that we developed. Uh, we were going down deeply into the planning, research, and measurement aspects of, of public relations. And there was a textbook that we were using here um, that I, I considered. Uh, it was still pretty general. It was very dated. I mean, you know, talking, you know, they were talking about crisis situ scenarios that were happening in the 1980s, and I knew that my students would not resonate with that. And the other thing I didn't like about it was $117. So um, I knew for, for, for a fact that I was gonna use open educational resources. And this time I was able to find the, uh, the, the great locations where all this stuff is, is, is contained uh, because of the classes I was taking uh, for business books and for so sociology types of, uh, of things. I found um, this, the, uh, what is it? The University of, of Minnesota's open access tech book, textbook site to be very, um, uh, good. It, it, there was many, many textbooks available here. I also found Merlot to be a great location. You can see in the drop-down box there the kinds of topics um, where they have textbooks that are available. Uh, again, in this situation, though, I didn't find a single one textbook that was ideal for this class. Uh, again, all the textbooks seem to be rather um, a, you know, a mile, a mile wide and an inch deep. So, uh, but what I did find were, were chapters in business books on things like, um, you know, uh, business practices that, that I needed my students to, to better understand. Um, I, was, I was finding, you know, deep dive uh, chapters on ethics and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I really was surprised when I, when I came to a point where I needed to teach them about, um, you know, the, the science of persuasion and how we persuade people, found a wonderful uh, chapter in a, a social psychology book, which I never would have thought to look in, you know, uh, before. So this gives you lots of ways to find material that you can, that you can draw from lots of different sources. In this class, I found yet another really cool thing. Um, I've always been a little um, bummed that my students don't always read uh, the material before class. So I like to use uh, just-in-time teaching. So I, I have the students answer a few warm-up questions uh, before every class where there is a reading assignment. And that works pretty well. But for this class, um, I discovered a, a, a thing called hypothesis, which is um, on the left-hand side of the slide there, you can see this is a, uh, it's a, it's a, a app that you can access, anybody can access in terms of being able to uh, annotate, you know, highlight, comment on online articles. But Hypothesis did a pilot here at, at uh, MSU Denver last semester uh, where we were able to use it through our uh, learning uh, uh, module, which is, we, we currently are using Blackboard. And if you go, for those of you who do use Blackboard, if you go to where you build content, uh, you'll find down there here at MSU Denver, uh, the option of selecting hypothesis. And what you can do there is set up an article. And what I did was that social psychology article that I referred to, uh, I put that into hypothesis and asked my students to read that article, highlight it, comment on it. I put in a few comments myself, some sort of probing questions for them to answer. And um, what, if this, is, this is what it, it looks like. Um, you see the article on the left there, you see the highlights that people have done, and then there's the, the uh, chat box basically on the right where they're commenting. And it's all asynchronous. This is uh, over a two or three day period. They dip in there, they comment, they answer my questions, they answer each other's questions. And, and as you can see, the, the, uh, uh, the, con the, the, the conversation is richer than you would probably get in a typical lecture uh, time in class. Uh, I really felt that what the students were doing was wrestling with the information, learning from each other. And then what was wonderful is that when we got to the class uh, and had the conversation, I had the benefit of knowing what they were saying, um, the questions they might have had, the areas that I, that I saw their energy around, and uh, areas that I thought maybe there were some misunderstandings that, that we needed to discuss. Uh, it really made for a fantastic uh, in-class session. Um, I did ask the students, uh, we did this with three articles during that semester, 
they loved it. They, they told me um, that was one of the best things they ever saw. Uh, the pilot did um, uh, survey the students and we did discover uh, that the, the mean score was pretty high on the things that we were looking for, things like uh, hypothesis is a valuable learning tool or hypothesis helped me to think critically about the reading um, or I learned a lot from my classmates annotations. Those were the things I was hoping this would do and uh, I felt like it really did achieve that. Um, the pilot sort of continues here at MSU Denver. If, you're, if you are a teacher here, um, you'll still see hypothesis there. Um, the, we're changing, uh, we're leaving Blackboard in a year or so, so um, it's unclear whether we'll be able to use hypothesis in the new platform, but um, if you uh, want to try it, it's an easy, uh, it's easy to set up or you can give me a call if, if you're having any trouble. So finally, uh, on the third um, class, it was a brand new class that I'm working on that's going to uh, launch in fall. Um, and this is a class where we are uh, talking about, you know, how can you be an entrepreneur in the media industry? Again, the media industry is totally in flux right now. There's lots of different uh, uh, jobs, different in, uh, startups that are happening in the industry. And as luck would have it, um, I found the ideal online resource, uh, an OER, um, that I found in the Minnesota list, but it is um, published by Rebus Community, which is a, a group of professors who I think, um, you know, make their materials available to other professors. And it's a very good book. Uh, I, it, it actually helped me think through the structure of my course. But as I was reading it, I also noticed that it was really heavy on the traditional media aspects, the news media. And I've got students who are interested in gaming and I've got students interested in sports and entertainment and lifestyle. And they're going into careers that will be media that's not the same as New York Times and Washington Post. So um, what I'm doing this semester is doing some interviews of people who are in the media industry, in some of those um, uh, different niche uh, uh, industries. Uh, getting their stories as sidebars that we can now upload into this textbook. The authors of this textbook are open to input from, from others. They kind of have, in, I think it's in its third edition now, it's inviting uh, the community to make this a, a, a textbook that is a living textbook. So those are the three ways that I, that I did it. Um, you can, uh, and, I, and I think if I were to summarize it would be that uh, there's so many uh, ways that this can improve your teaching. It improved my teaching, I believe, because it, uh, it sort of cut away that barrier of, of high cost textbooks because I knew a lot of students were, weren't even buying the textbooks. Uh, they were sharing textbooks. So that was one barrier that's knocked down. The other one is it simply, it made it easier for me to have uh, just-in-time teaching because uh, you know, I can send them off to a, to a site uh, have them read the articles, I could ask the questions online, and that would make for a, a wonderful class session after that. And then it's also just a, a great way to start thinking in terms of how can I, um, as, as a professor, share my knowledge um, broader than here at the university. How can I contribute to the open education resource? So with that, I think, um, are, there are there any questions here in the room for me? Or, or people can also chat. Okay, are there any questions? Um, you can also put in your questions on the chat. I have one question, and Emily might know the answer to this also. I think a Hypothesis is free, but uh, is that correct? Hypothesis is free? I think it, I yes. think it, yeah. it it's free, you know, if you're just a, 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 an average user, mm -hmm. it's free. Uh, what we were piloting for them was how can they connect that to a learning platform oh. like, like Blackboard. And they want to ultimately charge for it. Um, so they were giving it to Metro State for free during this pilot period. So now as we uh, decide where we're, whether we're gonna change our, well, we are gonna change our platform, um, you know, can we now port that over into the new platform? But we will, the universities will have to pay a, a fee for it wasn't very expensive. Yeah. There are faculty who use, maybe not necessarily at MSU Denver right now, but there are faculty who use Hypothesis just in its current, the web browser version that's available to everyone for free. You can make a group just for your class if you don't want people 
annotating publicly on the web. It's just a little bit more work and it doesn't link in with the grade book. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up, uh, but at the end of the presentation, we'll definitely open the floor again for any questions in the chat. Okay. Fantastic. All right, Emily. Thank you. Up to you. Thank you. Okay, so next up is, is one of my adventures. And I just want to say, um, a lot of times we hear about really awesome projects that people have done, and then sometimes we feel discouraged from even starting <laughs> because we can't wrap our head around how we would get to that place where we just had our students author a whole textbook or something that's really awesome and amazing. So I'm really, I, both Steve and I are really trying to share our actual experiences and how we've been iterating and taking baby steps and moving gradually in these directions that are exciting to us. So I teach an upper division biochemistry two class. It's a 4,000 level <laughs> class and it's a second semester 4,000 level class. Everyone in this class has already taken biochemistry one. And this has been a class where I've not been able to find an OER textbook um, at this point in time. And really my interest here has been more, not just um, can I shift and use an OER resource instead of a traditional textbook resource, but I want to help bridge the gap from an undergraduate education to what my students are going to be doing after they leave the university. I want to provide some scaffolding and structure to help them build usable skills that they can take with them and hit the ground running, whether they're going to graduate school or working in a lab or maybe going off to medical school or pharmacy school, all the different places these students might be going. So on the left hand of the screen, I have a depiction of the central dogma of molecular biology. And everyone I think is familiar with DNA as this molecule that's found in our cells. It has genetic information, it provides the instructions that make all the proteins in our body. And so we can see how we have DNA get converted by an RNA polymerase into an RNA molecule. mRNA molecules are converted into proteins. And so this is a process that we study in biochemistry too in some molecular detail. I spent about a third of the class going over processes related to this and, and the DNA and how it gets packaged up in the cell. Okay, so this is content that I was already covering in my class. And my question was, how can I move from just learning this content to helping my students work with DNA? Even if we're not in a wet lab, like how can we get a little bit more real with what we're doing? And so you can see on the right hand side of the screen that there's genome browsers. There have been so many different organisms where we've sequenced all the DNA in, in the organism and you can access that information online. If you're studying Drosophila melanogaster, which is a fruit fly, you can use a resource called Flybase. And so learning how to use a genome browser is going to benefit you if you're studying the DNA of many different organisms in the future. So I said, well, why don't we do a case study in the classroom and start using some of these awesome tools that are out there for studying molecular biology and biochemistry. And the bottom picture is a 3D structure of a protein. And what's really cool is every living creature is at least somewhat related to all other living creatures, right? We have the same mechanism of DNA and mRNA and protein, and we can actually study proteins in a model organism like that fruit fly and learn things about related proteins, maybe say that are in humans or in other organisms. So it's pretty incredible um, how we can do that. So this is the space that I'm trying to play in with my class. And so um, back, the first two semesters I taught biochemistry too. So spring of 2016 and the spring of 2017, I decided to add some individual in-class activities that I had written so the students can be a little bit more engaged. I teach for an hour and 50 minutes twice a week. Those are long class sessions. And I don't believe that lecturing for that entire time is going to serve either my students or myself well. So the idea was to bring in some active learning. And then in the fall of 2017, I realized for this module where we're studying DNA and RNA and protein, things link together. And so I could create a sequential project where students were working in the same group and followed um, kind of something through many different activities instead of having multiple one-off activities. Okay, so here I haven't been thinking about OER at all, just instructor-created content to try to augment my classroom. 
And then in the spring of 2018, I realized that I could take this sequence of modules and actually relate it to the research that I'm doing with my students, which is involved with um, iron uptake in insects. I was lucky enough to get some funding through the National Science Foundation, which really motivated this to happen. Like, let's bring some research into the classroom. And I'm gonna share a framework called course-based undergraduate research experiences that this is coming out of. So then, um, I attended a training in that course-based undergraduate research experiences in June 2018, and that's really shaped the work that I've been doing in the classroom since then. So what's this idea of a course-based undergraduate research experience? Again, this doesn't necessarily have to be OER, but the idea is that students are going to benefit from studying an authentic scientific problem and actually having the opportunity to maybe make some steps, even if they're just baby steps, into obtaining new knowledge. That's what we're trying to do in science, not just understand what we already know, but push that frontier and learn more. And the other idea about having these research experiences in a class is all of our students will have access to them. Right now, if a student wants to do um, research one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member, that's possible, but they're not going to get paid for the time that typically that they're spending to do that, and it's not accessible to all of the students in our program. Whereas if we can weave a research experience into the classroom, we're going to be able to impact more students. And another nice thing that I like about this CURE overview is they talk about the importance of iteration, and all of us who have performed research in whatever capacity or field know that you work on something and you have to revise or reiterate and, and um, get some trial and error and then trying again into the process. And finally, this is where I feel like cures and open pedagogy really overlap nicely. The idea is to have um, in the cure the communications back to stakeholders. In the case of my little project, that has just been simply my students writing a memo to my collaborator at Kansas State University informing her of their findings. Ideally, we would love to get to the place where we have a, a, a paper or something coming out, and that would be also communicating back to stakeholders. There's other open pedagogy projects where students are creating content that's being shared in different ways with the world. And so I think this is a nice intersection of cures and what people often think of as open pedagogy. Another thing that came out of this was um, in addition to my students trying to share out, at least in some small way, an authentic product with some stakeholder in the community, it encouraged me to share out my work with the larger community. And so there's this CureNet website where I was able to put up all of the content for this course-based undergraduate research experience, my student goals, the research goals, and all sorts of resources that I had created for the different modules in my class, the rubric that I'm using for the a memo and all of this work I was able to share out under a Creative Commons license so that other faculty can take this and they can say, well, I don't care anything about iron in Drosophila, but I care about cancer-related proteins in humans. I want to do a similar project. Well, if they want to start with what I did and iterate from there, it's available to the larger community. And so I think this is a really powerful thing that faculty have done informally is we will share our resources with our colleagues or anyone who asks. But Creative Commons licensing really allows us to share out with a much wider community, with people we don't even know, but people who might be interested in similar sorts of projects. So um, one other tool that I used with my students was an online notebook program that they can all access for free called Benchling. And the students um, can work with amino acid sequences and DNA sequences in this program, but they can also take notes. And I've been using that as a way that I can grade the students throughout the project. I can check in on their benchling entries and make sure that they're on track and that they're understanding things well. So that's a resource that I've been using with the students for several semesters. So how do the students feel about this? I did give an anonymous survey at the end of, uh, I've given it every semester for the last um, couple of years. And here's just a few student comments when I asked them uh, what they felt worked well for this project. One of them really liked to see the correlations between the class material, the standard content, and current scientific research. So they liked learning about genes and then being able to study a case study of a gene in Drosophila. And each group got to have their own gene. 
Um, as someone else said, we were able to gain experience with bioinformatic tools that otherwise would not be part of any course. So what I think is exciting is when we start thinking creatively, we can bring in experiences that we wouldn't necessarily think we could even have in a lecture classroom um, because we're realizing there's a whole world of resources out there that we can incorporate. Another, um, some other comments were that they got an opportunity to analyze data and can conduct their own research on a protein sequence using all of the tools that they've learned. So I have this structured um, cure with the students studying a protein that I gave them, the DNA and then the protein that's made from it in the first half of the class. And then in the second half of the class, each student independently takes those skills they learned and they get to pick any gene and its protein product that they personally are interested in. I'm kind of hoping someone will uh, pick a coronavirus <laughs> uh, envelope protein to study for the second half of this semester. But they can use the tools that we've learned in an example that was of interest to me, and then they can apply the tools to an example that is of interest to them. And I think uh, that's a lot of fun for the students. And then finally, because they were working in groups for this first half of the class, they had to build some teamwork skills. And I know not every student always use that positively, but this student certainly found that um, it worked well, that they did get to hone those skills. And honestly, those skills are so important as we move forward into our careers. So I also asked the students for some suggestions for changes to the class. Um, this was, these are my uh, results from fall 2019. I'm so excited that multiple students were saying they wanted more full class days for the project. Usually I do half lecture, half in, half project time. And we would have one day that's in the computer lab that we would uh, play with those protein structures on the computer all day long. And I'm really excited that I've gotten to the place with this project where the students realize how this project isn't just something that's distracting them from lecture and lecture is the main aspect of the class, but this is equally important that this is as vital as the time that we spend on lecture and they're actually wanting more time on the project. It has taken me several semesters to get there. At first students said, why aren't you just lecturing the whole time? And my, I'm gonna give you guys just some suggestions for ideas for how to support students when we're doing innovative things in the classroom here in just a couple slides. Um, some students long for more explanation. And while I've increased the amount of explanation that I give them, it's good to get feedback from a few of them that they would have liked more something that I can change in future uh, semesters. Um, I'm also throwing a lot of online programs at the students. I mentioned Flybase. There's a program called Uniprod that's all about proteins. And so this particular student would have liked just a little bit more training and support in using the new programs. And again, that's something I can think about how to provide more support in those areas. And um, this last comment, that semester, fall 2019, everyone had a ferric reductase. And this semester, I'm not using ferric reductases. We're looking at other proteins involved in iron transport. And this is fun for me because I can keep mixing up uh, which proteins we're using. And it keeps it interesting and fresh for me as well as for the students. They're not just doing something that other people have done uh, several times before. So I liked that suggestion because I'm on it. Like we're, we're already doing something different this semester. I have also had a very recent positive experience with Hypothesis. This is my, this spring 2020 is my very first semester using Hypothesis in the classroom. And what, what worked so well for me is there are these resources through Science Magazine where faculty got together and wrote information about some of this um, cutting edge molecular biology and biochemistry for a student audience and helping them understand what we've done with Drosophila melanogaster, this model organism, and why research in a fruit fly can actually even help us understand humans better, which is not, and you guys might be like, yeah, I'm not sure why you keep talking about flies, but it actually really can be helpful. And so this is an online web source that everyone can access for free online. It's not technically OER, and then it doesn't have a Creative Commons, but I'm free to use it with my students and we don't have to pay any royalties for it. I was able to pull this in to our learning management system and use Hypothesis very easily, although I could have also done this with just a little bit of extra work using um, Hypothesis on the web. And what was magical for me about using Hypothesis is I have been encouraging my students to look at these mod and code science magazine resources for the past several semesters. It's a beautiful intersection between my research and what's more in a traditional textbook. 
the students were not doing the readings. This is just the honest truth. Everyone's busy, and if something isn't incentivized, that doesn't have a deadline, it maybe won't happen. This is the first semester where I've had students reading, asking questions, and again, to get back to Steve's point about just-in-time teaching, prior to going in and lecturing, I can review the comments that the students have made on the reading and see what questions have come up. Sometimes there's something I covered in lecture, I thought I covered it clearly, but there's questions in that same area so we can go back and review that particular area some more. Or this reading has introduced them to new ideas that weren't on their radar and maybe I need to talk more about those cool ideas in the classroom because people are interested and want to know. Students can share back um, videos. So if a student finds a resource that they found particularly helpful, they can share about that in um, this discussion, in this annotation page of Hypothesis. So the students highlight text that they found interesting and type their comment. They can reply to each other and we can get a conversation going that enriches the time that we spend together in the classroom. And honestly, you guys, I think the secret to good teaching is to not just have the students engaged in the classroom, but have them working hard outside the classroom too, right? We're maximizing the hours and their days and their weeks. So they're spending more time on our content and learning it um, learning it more deeply and in a um, more meaningful way. Um, here's, not only did I use these science mag, magazine mod and code pieces that were written for students, but as we were getting later in the project, we looked at a couple of papers that were related to their proteins of interest. And again, the students could um, annotate and make comments and connect it to other things. For example, a student wrote, um, the, the annotated part was the control of insect-borne diseases is vital for numerous developing countries. And someone pointed out there was a recent outbreak of locusts in Africa, right? And that's been a major problem. So students are making connections between the content and things that are of personal interest to them. So here's my last formal slide before you get to our email addresses and we'll have a chance for some questions. Um, how can we support students when we're doing innovative things in the classroom that might feel uncomfortable or weird or a little disconcerting? Why don't we just have a traditional textbook? Or why are we doing this group project with some of our time? So this has been a little hard for me to learn. I had to have a student learning assistant tell me this. She said, you need, what you're doing in the class is awesome. You need to make the case to the students so they understand why you're doing it. So, Explain the benefits. Give the students a larger picture. Why am I making these choices? And why do I think this is a benefit to you? And realizing students can't read our mind and that we need to communicate that really clearly and explicitly with them to help get buy-in and so they understand what we're asking them to do. One thing that really helped me in this department is I got a testimonial from a former student who had been not a super huge fan of this project and she went off to graduate school and she found that she was using these resources that we had studied in my class and she said, I was expected to know how to do all of these things with no training whatsoever in graduate school. I'm so grateful that I had this opportunity in your class. So now I make sure to share that with my students along with the rationale for why we care about iron uptake in insects, which I haven't bored you guys with, but really making the case for my students about why uh, this is, a, um, is important has really, really helped, I think, students understand what I'm asking them to do and to be more enthusiastic and engaged with doing it. I also think we have to provide a lot of support, and this might um, vary depending on what innovative thing we're doing in the classroom. So for example, for having these groups, I the very first day of class, we meet in the groups and we talk what are positive experiences you've had in the past with group work and how have things gone wrong in the past and what are some strategies we can use to overcome those common obstacles in group work. So I think that's a very helpful conversation that gets the groups off to a good start. So that works with that particular aspect of my particular class. But regardless of what class you're teaching, maybe having clear learning objectives and sharing them with the students can be helpful. Students uh, often have a lot of anxiety around their grades because that's how they're used to being assessed. And I think if we use that effectively, if we assess the things that are important to us, there's this positive feedback loop. So sharing things like rubrics and assuring them that the effort they're putting into this project actually will impact not just their learning, but actually the grade in the class also, uh, students find that reassuring. 
Uh, one thing that I have found helpful is if I'm doing something new, I'm taking a piece of the class and iterating it, it can be helpful to give a survey not just at the end of the semester, but in the middle and get some student feedback when there's still time to respond to it. And that's just something else you can do to help get students um, having a voice and so making sure that um, what we're doing is meeting their needs as well. And then finally, something that I haven't actually done in my Biochemistry 2 class, but I've done in an online general chemistry class that uses all um, open educational resources, is I have the students write recommendations to future students and I share those with the incoming group of students. Students last semester really recommend taking notes, even though this is an entirely online class, you know, and sharing some of these student-generated best practices for success in the class. And so that's just another idea of something that we can do to help bring students along with us when we're doing innovative things in the classroom. Okay, so here is the contact information for both Steve and myself. We'd love um, to uh, answer any questions now or shoot us questions later and we could um, communicate with you one-on-one -on -one with anything that you're interested in. Yeah. We have some. We will open the floor now for any questions. Uh, can we the chat? Or questions in the room. We have we have a couple of our FLC participants, and we've got Ellen in here. For the group projects, uh, you were um, were you only assigning individual grades to students, or also in terms of groups? Okay, so. Group. The, the grading for the group projects, and the group project is really 100 points out of 750 total. So depending on how you think about it, it's as much as a midterm, but it's also not a huge part of the grade. The benchling entries are graded. Previous semesters, I graded every single student's benchling entries instead of having them work as groups. And that just made me very sad on Saturdays. It <laughs> it was so much grading, it was very hard. So this semester, spring 2020, I've had them doing their benchling entries in groups, and that's worked pretty well. Students cannot, multiple students can't be in the same benchling notebook page at the same time. So next semester, I'm gonna tell them everyone keeps their own little notebook, but then you consolidate things and I'll just grade one entry per group, for example. So that's something where in the past, it was a more individual grade for that, which is like a third of the project grade. And now that actually is more of a group grade now. I, at the end of the group project, I give um, an evaluation form. I ask them some questions, including to rank themselves and their classmates in three categories. How much they contributed in class, how much they contributed outside of class, and how much they contributed to the memo the final product to my collaborator. And if there's a student who's consistently getting low scores, either from themselves and or their classmates, not just one bad score, but there's the whole group is in consensus, then I do adjust the grades accordingly for a little bit for the students in that group. So, so there is a lot of collaborative element. I also encourage them that if a group is having trouble working to come talk with me and we can do some uh, troubleshooting with a specific group if they're having more challenges than just the normal challenges. Um, okay. uh, for the online tools that you're using, like Benchlink and Hypothesis, for someone who's never used that before on the student side, um, how do you like teach them how to use it before they actually get so the question was, how do we train the students to use these programs like Benchling and Hypothesis? And Hypothesis is so easy, quite frankly, they don't need training. Is that your experience too, Steve? Yeah, we, um, especially when it's, when it's put into Blackboard, uh, it, it, they get the assignment on Blackboard, they click on a link. Um, the, once you get to Hypothesis, there's pretty clear directions on this is what you do next. Um, I, I do mention it in the first class, you know, I do kind of, you know, I actually will show them a frame graph so they can see what it looks like, but, um, but then I say, you guys are going to figure it out. So. Yes, so neither of us, I believe, has, has experience using just the hypothesis on the web, in which case the students would have to create a free hypothesis account, and so there would need to be some more support and training using it in that context, but I've heard from faculty members at other institutions who do that, and it's been really fun for them, too. Um, with Benchling, it's gotten easier because our biochemistry lab class is now using it too. And so this semester, I have the majority of my students had experience with it. In previous semesters, I have had to do a little bit more support. I've written out 
my own little version of instructions, like do this, this, and this for some different things that I'm asking them to do. So I created a, just a little bit of my own uh, support materials. And, and really that's um, a challenge for me also with Flybase and Unipro. Like there's all these awesome online resources that are very complicated, have a ton of information. And so supporting students and finding pieces that will be helpful to them and not feeling too overwhelmed is, is an ongoing challenge for me in that class, but it's also, it, that's a skill also though. Like my um, former student, she just got thrown off the deep end in graduate school. So at least I'm providing more structure than um, you would maybe get in like a graduate program. So I think it's pretty cool that you're able, that, that here in that you're able to put up your syllabus and all the supporting materials. Do you know if there's other places where professors kind of share that kind of yeah. information? Um, Ellen, what would you recommend for places for faculty to share these other course resources, say syllabi and in-class activities or other things that they've created for a class? So there are a number of repositories that you, you want to come up here. Oh, sure. Well, I don't know. Can, can I be heard? Oh, I, he said we should probably stand over here okay. for best. Ah. Thank you, Ellen. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, um, so there are a number of repositories where all that uh, kind of thing can be shared. Uh, Merlot, for example, is one of uh, the repositories. What I recommend, I think uh, most of the people probably listening to this are associated with universities and colleges. It's most likely that your library has um, a repository available to host the materials that you have. And so I would check, uh, check in with the library to see if they do have that uh, option for you. Because once you have that hosting space, then it can be go into what they call all these referatories that are not actually hosting the material, but they will describe it for you. They'll make it easy for people to find. You know, like University of Minnesota, they have their site, but I'm guessing it's probably duplicated in a number of places, OER Commons and things like that, and the Open Textbook Library, for example. So help. That's helpful. Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> so I guess one more question, those of us who are um, on the Auraria campus, would the Auraria Library be willing to host things like a syllabus and course materials? I know you put um, books, OER books, and other resources like that in the repository. Yeah, so I know that our library is working through some details as far as uh, what can be put up in a way that's going to be really um, comfortably accessible through our repository. So I have to tell you the truth, which is we're still working through some questions. So for example, we just got a question from the Community College of Denver, wanted to put a course up uh, in HTML, and we are going to be able to do this, but there are a few things um, that we're working out. So sometimes um, it is a matter of, you know, talk to your library about what are, what are the best ways to, you know, depending on what the format is and things like that, they may have to adapt a little bit. But I would say in general, the answer is yes, and definitely ask, and we'll see what we can do to put it up there in a way that's really usable and uh, easy to access. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have a chat that came up from... Oh, many libraries do not have that space. Uh-oh. So, um, in that case, um, I, so I don't know if you're doing a cure. I know that cure, CureNet is a place, but there's faculty actually who just have their own web pages too sometimes. Do you know, Ellen and Merlot, where if people don't have access to a library resource where they might be hosting things on their own? I, I don't have, um, I'm sorry, I don't have, a I don't have a specific answer to that. I know that in some cases, I know in some cases the institution can also help out, you know, that they may have a hosting spot. So I have to tell the truth, which is, um, uh, I, I don't know all the choices for that one. I, I can't answer that one. So, um, Rihanna, do you have experience with using OER, is that OER Commons, OERC? Uh, to host materials, or is that more of just a referatory? So if the, the item needs to live somewhere that that these um, referatories like OER Commons will pull it from, but what they do is make it easy for people to find that the resources exist. This is what Ellen thinks. So, um, so maybe check out OER Commons too and see if they're, they're referatory. They're referatory. Uh, the Department of Higher Higher education will also be building a referatory uh, for the all the classes that came out from the first. Here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the Colorado Department of Higher Education is putting together a referatory 
uh, with all the classes uh, that use OER from the first grand cycle. And we will be getting the report uh, from the first cycle grantees by the end of May. And so we, they should be posted on our page um, by the end of May. So make sure to keep an eye out for that. And we would definitely stay in contact with you all via um, the Open Education Ambassadors. Uh, we will make sure to have that information out for you all. So whichever you know resources Emily used uh, will be available for any other uh, chemistry professor to use as well, as well as um, journalism. Key. Yeah, journalism. Good. I wonder if Rumi, Rumiana here uh, could comment on what the link is that, uh, that they have. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, didn't, I was not aware of OER Commons being a place you could place material, so I'm not sure what that link is. Um, yeah, um, well, I appreciate people engaging and sharing resources in the chat here and sharing a link to uh, an OER Commons discussion. and. Yeah, this is, this is good. We can crowdsource strategies for answering the different questions that we have. One of which is if we've created content, how can we share it with the world? Do you have any other questions? I think if I could just make one like final call, it's feel free to try small things and iterate. And it's not going to be for many of us, a huge, grandiose change in success in a single semester. We change pieces and see how that works and keep iterating. And, um, but that keeps us really engaged with our teaching. It keeps us having fun and it keep, keeps us connected with our students because we're in this process of discovery and creation together. Right. And, and I think that's uh, uh, the point that I, that I didn't quite get a chance to make is that um, each semester I get to go back and look at the OER materials I selected and you know i can easily you know plug and play take things out put things in um it, and, and it's uh so much easier than selecting a textbook and have to pretty much be stuck with that textbook for you know, yep. several semesters well and especially in your discipline where things are changing so mm -hmm. fast public relations mm -hmm. and, and crisis management yeah. and um, influencers yeah Okay, well, thank all you right. all so much for joining us yeah. today. We really appreciate your time and attention. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to talk to uh, Professor Steve Prisman and Dr. Emily Reagan. We really appreciate you hosting a webinar during Open Education Week and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, I just wanted to, I have a few announcements that I just posted on the chat. Um, if you liked this webinar, please make sure to check out our other webinars. Um, I posted a link to it. Uh, so we have uh, recorded webinars from the past few days and then we will have one more uh, tomorrow. So please make sure to check that out. We will have a meme contest. So please make sure to enter uh, a meme for a chance to be featured on the CDEG website, our Twitter website. And then also we have the ZTC challenge, the zero textbook cost challenge. So uh, Governor uh, Polis that is, has just released this challenge a few months ago and you could nominate amazing professors like Professor Steve and Dr. Emily um, to this challenge and winners will be announced during our conference, the OER conference in June. We will be hosting the statewide OER conference through the 4th and 5th. I also put a link in here. If you're interested, please make sure to check it out and try to speak in. Thank you so much, That's and awesome. we'll see you soon. Okay, okay. thank you. Bye. Bye.